Before I begin, I'd also like to acknowledge that we're meeting today on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and to pay respect to Elders past and present. So I've had a lot of interest in this topic and so I'm hoping to give a speech today that although it um, will deliver some depressing stats, is not a message that does not have hope because I think there is a way forward. Talking to a room full of graduate women who clearly value the purpose and power of an education, it's slightly uncomfortable to ask, is education still the great equaliser for women? I myself come from a family that highly, highly valued education for women. My grandmother, who was born in 1915, never got the chance for a university education, was very, very keen to go, but her parents basically wouldn't pay for their daughter to go. They'd pay for their sons to attend, but they wouldn't pay for their daughters to attend. What was the point? They were going to get married. So grandma never got a university education, but she was fiercely dedicated to making sure that her daughters did. So she raised three daughters and one son, and the three daughters ended up being the first three sisters in Australia to get a PhD. So <laughs> grandma achieved her goal, and then later on, went back and got a degree herself at Macquarie University when she was in her 60s. So her personal legacy for both her daughters, but also for her granddaughters and now great-granddaughters, is that we're a family that has always highly valued education and a family that really does believe that education is the great equaliser, not just for women, but for everyone. However, as a graduate myself, I was always taught to examine the data. And when it comes to whether education acts as a great equaliser for women in Australia, the statistics are disturbing. So what is the data? Well, the 2016 Global Gender Gap Report had Australia as the number one country out of 144 OECD countries for educational attainment for women. We're number one in the world. We're number one for literacy in women. We're number one for enrolment of girls in primary and secondary education. We're number one for enrolment of women in tertiary education, right? Number one. We are collectively the most educated women in the OECD. Yet, when it comes to economic participation and opportunity for women, Australia ranks 42nd. So we go from number one, the most educated women in the world, to 42nd. And it gets worse. In labour force participation, we rank 55th. And for wage equality, we rank 60 out of 144 nations. Girls go to university in greater numbers than boys. They generally outperform them, to be honest. They win the majority of university medals and distinctions upon graduation. However, average graduate salaries for women are still 9.4% less than average graduate salaries for men. And the gender wage gap sits at a stubborn 16.2% for Australian women. Women are still much less likely to be promoted and remain underrepresented in the boardrooms and parliaments of our country. Average superannuation balances for women at retirement are 52.8% less than those for men. And in fact, a particularly disturbing statistic is that women over the age of 50 are now one of the largest increases in homelessness. So women are enormously educated, have all this talent, this potential, this drive, but by the time they retire, they're at risk of homelessness and poverty. In fact, everything after the getting of their tertiary degrees, statistically at least, goes downhill for women in terms of their economic participation. So I work at a university now, I'm at the University of Technology, Sydney, and one of our great catch cries that we all believe is that university is the great equaliser, but as much as we all love to say it, this clearly hasn't been the case for Australian women. Many, many studies have shown that despite high levels of education and early success, women are confronted and ultimately negatively affected by cultural and structural barriers they encounter when they enter the workplace and, of course, in society more broadly. Barriers are tied to bias in recruitment, biases in promotion and exclusionary workplace culture. 
there was a wonderful study to come out of Stanford where I'm sure people have heard of this, where they had exactly the same CV, so they wrote exactly the same CV and then they put a man's name on it and a woman's name on it and then submitted it and the male got ridiculously more interviews than the, than the woman candidate. Um, the fellow that was actually telling me that story, he runs unconscious bias training, and he was telling me that um, about the Stanford study, actually talked about his own personal experience. And he said he was a research assistant to an extremely well-known um, professor in the US. His wife was also a research assistant to an extremely well-known professor in her field in the US. Um, when he when they both jointly published with their, you know, professors, all his friends or in all the sort of community said to him, oh, good on you, gosh, you must be good. You got to jointly publish with X. And for his wife, everyone went, oh, yes, oh, gosh, so you, you know, put your name on that thing with X. You know, you're obviously just his assistant. I don't quite know how you managed to get your name on that. He said that the response to them both being in that position was utterly different. And these barriers are even more present for Indigenous women or women from non-Anglo-Saxon backgrounds, women from other minority groups. A similar um, case study has been done in Australia where they swapped Asian names for Anglo names on the CVs and said what happened. And of course, the Anglo CVs were um, picked up at a much greater rate. I myself had a friend of um, a wife of a friend who has an African surname and she was applying for jobs and applying for jobs, never getting any interviews. And finally she said, okay, well, I'll, I'll just use my husband's name because, you know, she doesn't normally use it, but she's married to him and his name's Walsh. And as soon as she started using his name, she got applicate, you know, she got interviews. Anecdotal, yet I think it speaks to a truth. We know it's true. There are also barriers related to caregiving responsibilities. Overwhelmingly, women still shoulder the burden of, well, not burden, the, the love, but the lion's share of childcare and also elder care. Careers are often not geared to accommodate both flexibility and opportunity for promotion. There's a perception that also that women are going to take time out of their work for child rearing and elder care. So that also op um, operates as a bias in the workplace. But also, at the same time, men suffer from these cultural biases. So men who then take parental leave and time out of the workplace, they're also treated a bit differently because that's not the role that they should be playing. They're not seen as serious players. We're dealing with millennia old cultural assumptions about femininity and masculinity. And it's really difficult to unpack these, but we do need to try. So I'm now going to talk about Hillary Clinton. <laughs> and it's not that I'm an, an enormous, I mean, I do like Hillary Clinton. I think she's a very interesting woman, but it's not like I'm a crazy Hillary Clinton fan. I have, um, you know, some reservations about her and stuff. But what I thought today, the reason why I thought I would talk about her is I think you probably can't get a better case study of where being better educated or better prepared for a job and it absolutely not mattering at all. And I do think gender played a very big role in the, I mean, other things played a role too, but I do think gender played a big, big role in the Trump um, electoral victory. I'm also using it as a case study because politics is just so important. You know, the who gets to be US president is so important to the future of the world. Um, political positions, positions of influence are so important. So when you see them played out on a global stage or writ large, they're a good opportunity to really analyse what went on there. So there was a lot of research and um, opinion pieces written after the, Hillary Clinton, the Donald Trump result. And one of the most interesting pieces I, I read actually came out of the London School of Economics, where they talked about the association of politician and male having an extremely strong correlation for a vast number of people. So most people, when they think of politician, think of male. And research out of the London School of Economics also showed that this correlation is particularly strong for male voters. So male voters in particular see the correlation. Women are closely associated with domestic traits of motherhood, of caring, of nurturing. We are expected to be submissive, supportive, the perfect deputy. Research has shown that women who exhibit behaviour that doesn't fit in with these cultural biases are found to be less likeable. In the business world, 
This doesn't always mean less employable, though it can mean that, but women sometimes just have to put up with being less liked. They are seen as pushy and ambitious when they speak up in a meeting, whereas their male colleague who speaks up in a meeting will be just seen as talented and showing his leadership skills. Nevertheless, sometimes in the business community that doesn't necessarily stop them from succeeding, although they do have to actually struggle with the fact that they're less liked, like, you know, which isn't comfortable. Um, they can, however, be respected if not liked. But in politics, this is a really big problem because being likeable is actually part of the job description. In fact, it's really part of what it takes to be electable, right? All the traits that society associates about with being likeable in a woman, nurturing, giving, loving, supportive, are not the traits necessarily exhibited by a successful politician. And Anne Summers wrote a really great article after Hillary Clinton's defeat where she described how male politicians are able to become likeable despite their ambition. And they become likeable due to the sort of twinkle in their eyes, such as, you know, George W. Bush's, you know, roguish, you know, <laughs> Bill Clinton was a charismatic philanderer. So even though he did all that, he was sort of also charismatic. Um, but women can't have a twinkle in their eye. Women can't be flirtatious like that. Can you imagine? I was thinking the other night, um, watching the Barnaby interview. Can you imagine if that had been a woman, if Barnaby had been a woman, um, what would have happened to her? They need to be knowledgeable and precise in order to avoid being seen flighty and without substance. And most of all, they have to seek political power whilst pretending that they're not really seeking political power because then they become unlikable. And I think you can see this played out in our own politics. I think it affected Julia Gillard. I think the way that she took the power from Kevin Rudd was seen as particularly problematic for a woman. She was seen as ambitious and stabbing him in the back and being horrible. Whereas when Ma Malcolm Turnbull did something almost exactly the same to Tony Abbott, although it didn't totally work out for him, you know, there's been a lot of, um, you know, grumbling since, he wasn't seen as being attacking and vicious and underhanded, he was seen as being ambitious and taking, taking his opportunities when they arose. He has not been attacked for ambition in the way that Julia was, you know. It is acceptable that he should seek to be PM. There is an acceptance that this is the way power is pursued and that it's natural for men to take these opportunities when they arise. But it's not seen as natural for women. Women, oh sorry, that's okay. <laughs> women in politics are at the height of their likability and popularity when they are deputies. Look at Julie Bishop. It is such a good example. She is so, you know, popular. But I often wonder, I wonder if she ever, if she took the next step, would that popularity stay? Look at Tanya Plibersek. She's very popular in the deputy role. And look at Julia Gillard when she was deputy. She was very popular as deputy. It all sort of went downhill once she became prime minister. And look at the stratospheric popularity of Hillary Clinton when she was secretary of state, when she was supporting Obama and in the, in the deputy role. It's the striving for power that makes women unlikable, under, undertaking the very act that you must do in order to be a successful politician or to have a successful career in many cases makes you unlikable, unfeminine, and open to what is very often a vitriolic attack and quite, um, you know, sexist online attacks. The most sexist part of the election campaign was that Trump was still seen as an acceptable candidate despite his many, many, many transgressions. If Hillary had done just a smidgen of what he had done, she would have been destroyed, absolutely destroyed. And that, if that isn't a double standard, I really don't know what is. So what's the answer? Well, things are not going to change until we recognise that it is culture that is holding us back. The specific problem with workplace cultures in areas historically dominated by men is that they still, even in 2018, and they're getting better, but even in 2018, they still operate under a set of assumptions that don't work for women, in many workplaces, systemic flaws are entrenched, inherited from a time when the workplace was designed for and from a single perspective, a full-time male breadwinner 
with a wife at home <laughs> to do all the other things, to do the caring, to look after both mother and her children. That is still, unfortunately, the, the dominant paradigm in most workplaces. But society is changing. Everything's much more complicated now and workplaces aren't adapting quick enough. I don't know if people saw the Annabelle Crabb book where she basically said, what everyone needs is a wife. <laughs> Wouldn't it be wonderful? Every female politician in particular needs a wife who can raise the kids and look after the home. It would be just so fantastic. But those roles don't exist anymore and, um, and we need to actually be honest about that. The problem is not the pipeline. So when people say there's a pipe, there is not a pipeline problem. Our OECD, our OECD data shows that our women are educated, skilled and ambitious. They're there, but they're not surviving the system. Without implementing interventions into workplace culture and the culture outside the workplace, we will not see change. We need to be supporting workplaces to accommodate men and women with caring responsibilities and working to address cultural issues that impact on all staff's well-being. We need to break down that women are the carers and men are not the carers thing because this, this also pigeonholes men into a very narrow set of assumptions and roles as well. We should be experimenting with blind recruitment where CVs are de-identified or removing all dem demographic information in applicants' resumes or other forms of submissions so that the selection panel only reads the facts about the candidate and don't add their own assumptions based on gender and race. We need to be constantly asking ourselves how we can continuously improve women's participation at each key stage of their careers. And we need interventions that build critical mass. We need to be implementing gender targets and quotas to increase gender equality in leadership across all sectors. And yes, I am going to talk about quotas because it is controversial. You know, what does this mean? What does this mean? But to me, I think merit is like beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder. Most people would not consciously decide to hire candidates based on whether they remind them of themselves. But what research has shown us is that most of us possess one unconscious bias, and it's called affinity bias. And it's this that can lead people to select candidates who are like themselves. And I think I had this as well. Like, I think if you're really honest with yourself, the sorts of people you tend to like are people like yourself. You get along with them, you can chat, you've got a sort of whole cultural heritage you share with them. You can see how it happens. It doesn't have to be evil to be, tr you know, to be the fact that it happens. Affinity or similarity bias is where people seek out those who share their backgrounds, group membership or experiences. If hiring managers and boards of directors are made up of mostly men, which has been the historic thing, who are unconsciously engaged in this bias, it stands to reason that more men than women will continue to be hired and promoted, particularly men who share the same background with current managers. And this is part of the the intersectionality piece, that it's not just about gender too, it's about race and class and all the other things. How do you make the workforce and, and opportunities more diverse? It only serves to perpetuate, if you allow this to continue, it does only serve to perpetuate the cycle of men outnumbering women in leadership positions. You have to have an intervention. I'm going to use politics again as an example, partly because it's where I've used to be and so I've got some um, case studies of my own. Um, but again, because I think it is a pinnacle profession, and I think that if you can um, crack politics, there's lots of lessons to be learned from that because it's such a high conflict, very masculine environment in lots of ways. So if you can start to change that, that's quite critical. So in politics, like most of the other sectors, even if parties engage in pre-selections where the membership, the membership gets a vote, often the membership is dominated by men and often the membership is is often of a certain generation too because a lot of party memberships are actually getting older so they tend to be men baby boomer and above sort of thing now in Australian politics it would be hard to argue that the Labor Party doesn't possess a blokey culture it does right it's a pretty blokey environment yet Labor currently has more women on the front bench than the Liberals have in the whole House of Representatives only one in five coalition senators and members of parliament are women, 
whereas Labor is close now to having 50% of its parliamentarians as women, right? So how on earth did this happen? You cannot argue that the Labor Party was this beautiful kumbaya sort of womany environment. You know what I mean? In the 1990s, but I'll tell you how it happened, and this is why I believe in quotas and targets. In, in the 1990s, the ALP National Conference set a target to achieve 40% of women MPs by 2000, and then they raised it later on to 50%. Now, this is interesting. At first, nothing happened. So they set this sort of aspirational target, a little bit like what we're seeing the Liberal Party do now. They sort of said, yes, we really must do something about this. And nothing happened. You know, There were lots of arguments about merit and needing to put the right person forward, and, and really nothing happened. And barely any women were pre-selected in those first few years. But then things got serious. Quotas were issued and women were given waiting in pre-selections. For the first time in history, the affirmative action rule made it advantageous for the machine, and at this stage the machine were mostly male power brokers, to run women candidates. Suddenly the machine men had a competitive advantage to run a woman against the man, against a man. So when I have talk about weighting in pre-selections, it means if you're a woman, you've got a 10% weighting. Meant that just, so they didn't get rid of the voting, they just said you get a little bit more as a woman just to encourage it. More importantly, if there weren't enough women pre-selected, the state branches were made to reopen their pre-selections and knock off male candidates until there were enough women. And this was a really big stick to wield because it took power away from the state branches unless they came up with enough women candidates by themselves. So again, whether or not they were feminist or anything, it made a lot of sense. Well, at least we'll still get to control the situation if we make sure there are enough women as candidates. The machine therefore started to seek out women candidates but also, and I'd like to say this more optimistically, because it's not just about the men, women also started to put themselves forward because they thought, oh, I could actually have a chance of getting pre-selection. I'd never thought I would in the past, but I actually could now. And the focus of getting women into safe seats in the 1990s and the 2000s for the Australian Labor Party have allowed some Labor women the sorts of political careers that used to only ever happen for men. So when you look at the 1998 generation of women that went in from the Labor Party, Tanya Plibersek, Julia Gillard, Nicola Roxon, um, Senator Penny Wong, they were all elected into very safe seats, thus enabling them to concentrate on their political and ministerial careers without constantly worrying about their survivability in their electorate. And for many years prior to the affirmative action changes, women, when they did make it to parliament, were usually in very marginal seats. So even if they were there, they actually still had to do everything back home and couldn't actually have a really full leadership um, career. The pledge for more women, when it was still just a pledge and a statement of intent, did not work when it was just about reward and a pat on the head and, and, a, and a carrot, in inverted commas a stick was also needed. And once that stick was wielded, women were pre-selected and a critical mass started to build. The culture internally started to change as more and more women started to gain positions of power. Now, the sta culture started to change. I'm not saying it's perfect <laughs> by any means. I, I think that the culture at, at a political level across the parliament needs a whole lot of work. <laughs> You know, which I think women have a very good role to play in. But, you know, I'm not saying the culture is perfect, but it is an example of a very masculine environment being, cha being challenged by a bold refusal to accept that there is a level, level playing field for women when they are seeking positions of influence and power. It, there just simply isn't. And this is what every sector needs. It's bold initiatives that recognise that the problem is not women. It is not their fault. You know, it's not because they're not educated enough, it's not because they're not charismatic enough, it's not because they're not driven enough. There are structural impediments to their advancement. Addressing these issues will be so very beneficial for all of us, and I don't think I need to tell this room that. We know that when more women get involved in any field historically dominated by men, the general knowledge of that field tends to expand. 
we look at issues, women look at issues from more diverse perspectives and apply those perspectives perspectives to problem solving. There's an enormous amount of research being done of the of the financial impact of diversity on boards, for example. You know, really good examples of why diversity is a is a positive. And when you empower half of the workforce to contribute equally, you have more innovation, you have more economic growth, and you have better social outcomes, full stop. Every year we spend hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars training scientists engineers and doctors, training those wonderful women who get the university medals. Removing structural barriers to participation and advancement in the workforce means that we can reap the social and economic returns of our educational investment. Not just for those women and their families, but also for the country. It's actually the right thing to do for the country. And I would argue in the 21st century, with all the wicked problems that we're facing, we need to be employing every single brain we can to help us solve those problems. And most importantly, we can ensure that education does continue to be the great equaliser for women that it was always meant to be. Thank you.